Hey everyone, today I'll be giving you an introduction to threat hunting with pandas and Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so what I'm going to be covering in this introduction is um, a simple workflow you can use from um, extracting data from a machine through to loading that data and searching it um, using pandas. So the first thing we want to do is uh, start off with a program called Redline. So what Redline allows us to do, it allows us to create what's called a collector. Uh, a collector is a script that we can run on a machine to um, acquire a whole bunch of data that we can search. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to start off by creating a standard collector. The first thing you want to do is select the target platform. Because I'm going to be doing this on my local Windows machine, I'm just going to keep it at Windows. The next thing you want to do is um, edit the script. So we click here. Now this is where we can select all the different types of artifacts we want to extract from a machine. Um, for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm just going to leave it at processes and get rid of everything else. But as you can see, there's a whole bunch of other forensic information we can um, extract from a machine. But again, for the purpose of this demonstration, we're just going to keep it simple and just collect the processes. You click OK. The next thing you want to do is select a folder to save the collector in. Click OK. This is going to create the collector. So now that our collector is generated, we can go to the folder where we saved it. And you see here there's a run redline audit. This is what we're going to run. So what this is going to do, this is going to um, run on our machine and grab all the data that we specified in our collector. In this case, it's just the processes. So if we go into sessions, analysis session, this is the audit we just uh, ran. And you can see that the files that were created are XMLs. We open up one. So Jupyter Notebooks can load XML files, but typically you're going to be working with a lot of data and multiple files. So XML files aren't that performant. So that's why we um, convert them from XML to Parquet files. So I'll show you how we do that. So there's a whole bunch of methods that you can use to um, convert your XMLs to Parquets. Uh, what we do, we just do it in a simple two-step process where we use um, Python scripts to convert it from XMLs to CSV and then from CSV to Parquet. So as you can see here, I'm running a script to convert it from XML to CSV. Generally when you're converting from XML to CSV, you'll need to specify the um, fields you want. Um, in this case, we're just looking for arguments names, path and username. As you can see, I'm just outputting it to a CSV, um, naming the file after my machine's uh, host name. So we run that. So now that we've converted it from XML to CSV, we've got another Python script that will convert it from CSV to Parquet. So I've already copied the Parquet to my project folder. So now I'm just going to go to my project folder and run Jupyter Notebook. So this is going to do, this is going to load the web UI. And this is where we can create notebooks or load ones we've already created. As you can see, I've already created two, but if you wanted to create a new one, you just click New, Python 3. So the first thing I want to show you is how we can load a single Parquet file using the one we just generated. So this is a notebook that I've prepared earlier. As you can see, the first thing I've done, I've imported the required dependencies. The second thing I've done is I've loaded the Parquet file into a data set. Now we've taken that data set and we've converted it to Panda and we've called it Win32 Processes. So if I want to inspect the data frame we've just created, I'd run the cell and then in a second cell I simply just call the name of the Panda. As you can see it's loaded all our data there's 265 rows, but it's only showing the first five and the last five for the moment. So the next thing I want to show you is how we load multiple Parquet files at once. So typically you're not going to be loading one file, you're going to be loading whole data sets. And I'll show you the ones that I'm going to be loading today. So we look in user accounts. We can see there's 25 files. Each file um, corresponds to a single machine that we've collected data from. And if we have a look in Windows, or Win32 processes, sorry, again, there's 25 files, all corresponding to a single machine. So these ones we're gonna be loading today. So similar to the previous notebook, the first thing we've done is we've imported the dependencies. 
and we've created our data frames. This time, rather than this time, rather than loading a single file, we're loading the directories. So the next thing I want to show you is how we can perform some simple searches on our data frame. First thing I want to do is inspect our data frame and see what data we can work with. So looking at this, I think that the arguments might be a good field that we could perform some keyword searches on. So I'm just going to close that. So a couple of keywords that I thought might be useful are PowerShell, so we could look for any um, processes that were started using PowerShell, and also HTTP, so maybe an argument has a website or something that it's trying to access. So the first one I'll look at is PowerShell processes. So this has returned seven columns. I think these are something we could drill down into later, but for now we'll just move on and look at the HTTP ones. And see, this has already yielded some more interesting results. So we've got some MSHTA calls, we've got some reg SVR32. So I think these are gonna be really interesting to look at. The next thing I wanna show you is how we can use regex expressions to find things in our data frames. So I've got one here, this is a simple uh, match for IP addresses. If you run that, you can see that that's found a whole bunch of matches. So that's quite a lot, and I think it might be a bit time consuming to go through all those one by one. So I think what would probably be best is if we export that to a CSV, so then we could perform some manual analysis on it um, with an easier format. But one thing I want to return to is some of those HTTP processes. So we may find columns we think warrant a bit more investigation. So what we can do, we can drill down into those by using the iLock method. So the iLock method allows us to supply an index, and if we run that, it returns just the single column. Now the bit of information that I think is most important here is the arguments, but it's not showing all of it. So we can further drill down into this column, just like we would any other kind of data object. So if we go dot arguments, we can isolate the arguments field. Okay, so that's returned just the arguments field. And this is a pretty interesting finding because this looks suspicious to me. So this is something that I think is worth taking note of. So this is how we can drill down into a single column and get a bit more information on a finding. But sometimes there might be a bit too many for us to look at, so that's why we might want to export our findings to CSV. So I'm just going to close this. A good candidate for this was the IP search. That returned a lot of findings, too many to drill down into individually, so we can export that to CSV. I think IP search is a good candidate for this. So all we have to do is call the data frame and then just use the to CSV method and supply it a file name. So in this case, we're just going to call it ipsearch.csv. So if we run that, we open up our project directory, we can see the IP search data frame has been exported to CSV. So we open this up. This is going to be a lot easier to perform some manual analysis on rather than going through each of these columns individually. The next thing I want to show you is how we can join data frames together. So you saw from the Win32 processes that there is some information on users, but there's not much. We also have another data frame called users that has a lot more information. So if we have a look here, the users data frame has a lot of information on each user. So we've got whether they're a domain admin, a domain user, what machines they've accessed, whether they're a local admin or a local user. So I think it'd be really helpful to combine this data with the processes data. And we can do that by using the merge function. So as you can see here, we're creating a new data frame called user processes, and we're using the merge function. We're supplying the Win32 process data frame and the users data frame. To join data frames, um, the two data frames you join need to have matching uh, columns. So in this case, both the Win32 processes and the users data frame have a hostname and username column. So this is what we're gonna join them on. So if we run that now, we can see that our user processes data frame has now combined both the data from the Win32 processes and the users. So this is gonna give us a lot more information that we can use to really drill down and find some really interesting stuff. Now we're gonna take a look at a couple of use cases for this merged data frame. One might be we've found a suspicious user, so we want to find all the processes that user has started. So if we look here, we're creating a new data frame where we're looking in the user processes data frame 
and we're looking for cases where the username equals greasyhug30. So if we run that, and we found five processes that the user greasy.hug30 has run. So these are things that we could drill down into and have a look at and see what they've been doing. So another thing we might want to look for is processes that were started with a domain admin account. So the reason why we might want to look for this is if we can identify processes that were started using a domain admin account, we can find machines that pose a pretty significant risk. If an attacker was to target one of these machines and dump credentials, they'd have the highest level privileges on the network. So it's something worth identifying and addressing. So similar to before, we're just looking in the domain admin field and seeing all the columns where that is true. So if we inspect that, we can see that we've found quite a lot. That's 111 instances. So this isn't that helpful at the moment. I think what would be more helpful is if we could drill down into this and only find the unique instances of hostname where domain admin accounts have been used to create processes. We can do that by using the unique method. So now we can run the unique method on the hostname field. And what this is going to do, this is going to return an array of all the hosts where a domain admin account has been used to create a process. So this is a lot more useful, but what I think would be even more useful is if we could count how many processes were started on each machine. We can do this by using the value counts method. So I'm just going to run this. So what this has done, this has created a list of all the hosts that have been affected, but it also counts how many processes were started on each. So we can see that the top three have quite a lot. So these are machines that I would definitely look into and see why domain admins are using these machines to perform regular user activities. So I hope this introduction has been helpful and given you an idea of just how powerful and also simple Jupyter Notebooks and Pandas can be and um, how you could use them in the field to great effect. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.